Good evening and welcome to ISS Summer Symposium Libertas 2022. I'm Shinja Kim, President and Chair of ISAS, and I would like to thank everyone for joining our program today. It is my pleasure to introduce today's special guest speaker, the Honorable James R. Klepper, who will address the issues and challenges with regards to the Korean Peninsula and the U.S. national security. Director Klepper is the fourth and the longest tenured U.S. Director of National Intelligence from August 2010 to January 2017. In this position, Jim led the U.S. intelligence community and served as the principal intelligence advisor to President Barack Obama, and he retired in 1995 after a career in the U.S. Armed Forces. It began in 1961 when Jim enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps Reserve and culminated as a Lieutenant General in the U.S. Air Force as the 11th Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Directly following his retirement, Jim worked in industry with superlative distinctions. He returned to the government two days after 9-11 as the third director of the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, and Jim served in this capacity for almost five years, transforming it into the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency as it is today. His numerous awards include three National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, two Defense Distinguished Service Medal, the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal, the Coast Guard's Distinguished Public Service Award, three Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Awards, the Presidentially Conferred and National Security Medal, and many other U.S. civilian and military, as well as foreign government awards and decorations. With that, ladies and gentlemen, it's such an honor for us to have Director Clapper here with us today and hope you enjoy the program. And let's welcome the Honorable Clapper. Thank you. Uh, gracious uh, 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 introduction, I, I appreciate it very much. I should uh, preface this for a bit um, on you know, why, I'm, why am I talking about the Korean Peninsula at all. Um, I first served there in the mid eighties. Uh, I was uh, the J2 or the director of intelligence for US forces Korea and the deputy uh, for C2, C2 uh, uh, the deputy intelligence chief for the combined forces command an arrangement that uh, still exists uh, today. So I served there from 1985 to 1987 and developed a, uh, a deep, interest in uh, the, the peninsula and uh, uh, you know I read a lot of books about the, about the war and uh, really uh, uh, really enjoyed the tour there I, I, uh, I thought the Air Force had banished me um, to the Korean Peninsula in those days that the position of J2 was an Air Force position that the joint staff came to its senses and changed it to army, which is really what it should be, not, not an Air Force guy masquerading as an army uh, intelligence officer, but I, I did for two years. So in my next assignment, I was the director of intelligence for what was then Pacific Command. So I, I sustained my interest in the peninsula, of course. And thereafter for any other of the jobs I had in the military uh, to include the last one, I uh, just stayed try to stay current on developments on the peninsula. When I became the, the DNI in 2010, um, and people in the White House were aware of my background with, with Korea and the Korean Peninsula. And in 2014, um, we had uh, two citizens, uh, US citizens who were incarcerated under hard labor conditions in North Korea. And for some reason, uh, the White House decided to send me to Pyongyang to retrieve these two um, uh, citizens. Uh, Mark Sanger of the, uh, or David Sanger of the New York Times uh, wrote an article about the trip after it was over and tried to explain why he thought uh, I was selected, you know, as the senior US military spy 
to be dispatched on a sensitive diplomatic mission to North Korea. And Sanger's explanation was gruff, blunt, a relic of the Cold War, <laughs> perfect for North Korea. So uh, I always love that. As And uh, President Obama and I had a big laugh about it when that article uh, came out. So um, what uh, that opened up the, the uh, possibility of, um, of course, afforded me the opportunity to have some dialogue with some uh, senior North Korean officials, not Kim Jong-un himself, but one layer down uh, below him. And my first White House uh, talking point that I was <laughs> instructed to deliver to the North Koreans was, you must denuclearize before we'll negotiate with you. Well, I was there a total of about five minutes and I realized that was a non-starter with the North Koreans. It was very clear to me then, and I don't think things have changed in the eight years since, that they have no inclination whatsoever to denuclearize. In fact, their behavior has been just the opposite. And they profoundly expanded their nuclear capability or more accurately, the perception of a nuclear capability, which is all they need for the purpose, their purposes, which is deterrence. And so I got reminded about, uh, for example, uh, by the North Koreans, uh, uh, what happened to uh, Muammar Gaddafi, who negotiated away his weapons of mass destruction and look how things turned out for him. Uh, and the North Koreans, I found in, in my intense dialogue there with them, are very much aware of their shortfalls, their weaknesses. They understand their economic challenges. They understand the military imbalance conventionally that they have with the Republic of Korea as buttressed by the United States. And one of the things that really um, impressed me when I was there was the palpable sense of uh, siege, of the siege mentality, the paranoia that exists in, in North Korea. So that it's pretty clear to me that they're just not going to denuclearize. So that, that made a big impression on me. And, and of course, you know, I lived through the Obama administration who, whose, pressure, whose policy was to push for denuclearization, just like uh, administrations before Obama. They all, we've all pushed the same thing, uh, Republican or Democratic administrations insisting on denuclearization. President Trump tried it uh, by uh, actually having meetings with uh, Kim Jong-un, which we had always disdained in, in the past. Actually, I supported on CNN. I said I thought it was a good idea for him to do that, provided which he didn't do, provided he used the considerable leverage that he gained simply by agreeing to meet. Because that's something that the Kim family has lusted for, uh, going back to Kim Il-sung, the prestige of a face-to-face one-on-one meeting with the President of the United States. That was a huge deal for them. It was, that was made clear to me uh, when I was there. A letter from President Obama, which is pretty perfunctory, which they really wanted badly. In fact, I, when I wasn't, we weren't real sure whether we were gonna get our two citizens back, I kind of held the letter out for a while as leverage, <laughs> such as it was. So what I uh, am gonna posit tonight, uh, my time tonight, is something I realize is heretical and uh, most of you won't agree with, but as I've thought about this, I wonder whether our continuation of the policy denuclearization is ever going to work. You know, the, you know, the half humorous definition of, of, of insanity where you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. So I wonder whether we shouldn't at least consider a different approach with North Korea with respect to the, their nuclear capability. You know, a lot of people are not real comfortable with the fact that the likes of India and especially Pakistan have nuclear weapons. Well, the fact is they have them. And the fact is they've been responsible stewards of the nuclear weapons. And a recent 
this recent incident involving misfiring of missiles by the Indians against the Pakistanis is a case in point. And the Pakistanis, uh, or the Indians, reacted very quickly to that because of, of their awareness, their sensitivity about a potential nuclear confrontation between those two countries. So I have raised this question, which is, of course, has fallen on deaf ears, and I'm quite sure will with this group as well, but I'll nevertheless share it with you. Now, I wonder if we shouldn't think about changing our approach with the North Koreans and um, think about recognizing what is already de facto as de jure. The North Koreans want what badly want to be recognized as a member of the nuclear club, which, which in fact, or at least the perception of a, I always point that out, uh, of being a member of a nuclear club, one of the nine or 10 nations that are armed with nuclear weapons. Well, if we think about, think through how to extract some concessions on their part and acknowledge that, and what, what might accrue from that. And, and of course, what you'd want to do if, if, you, if anyone seriously considered that, which I think politically, likely for either party is too hard to change, would be what inducements, uh, how could we induce the North Koreans to behave responsibly in the same way the Indians and the Pakistanis do and, and other, other nuclear nations do? So that's the basic uh, approach. Um, I, and my uh, intense encounter with the North Koreans eight years ago, and I, again, I don't think they changed, has not, has not changed that view. Um, I, you know, I, I think we would be better served uh, to have the equivalent of what we had in Havana for decades, which is a, 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 a U.S. interest section a diplomatic presence that would be in Pyongyang that would facilitate um, communication and, and dialogue rather than our depending on other nations, uh, I think Sweden, for example, to represent our interests on our behalf. And of course, we in return would have to allow the North Koreans a presence in Washington and as a way of promoting dialogue and as maybe funny as this sounds, but this would reassure the North Koreans that we're not going to bomb Pyongyang if we have official American presence there. That sounds a little hokey, but they, they really believe that, uh, at least when I, when I dialogue with them. Now, how might, you know, so what, what I'm getting at here eventually would be to persuade the North Koreans to enter into some kind of arms control agreement where a la Russia, US, we have weapons, we have nuclear weapons, but we have an agreement on their limits and inspection uh, uh, regime, at least up until recently. So I don't know if that's possible. I, I do think that this, uh, that uh, the Republic of Korea would almost, would have to be very prominent in any such dialogue because what the North Koreans most worry about is an invasion by the, the South and overthrow the regime. And only, the, only the, re the Republic could reassure and persuade the North Koreans that they, they wouldn't do that. So again, that's that's the notion in a uh, in a nutshell. Um, I, I don't have a big long treatise uh, to explain it. I would just suggest that the policy of denuclearization hasn't worked. In fact, if anything, it's been counterproductive. We've been in, imposing sanctions on the North Koreans forever. We were doing it when I was a J two there in the eighties, and they've always succeeded in evading them. So I would be much more for a broadened communication and at least a modest diplomatic presence uh, in each other's capitals. When I arrived in North Korea, I was the first uh, uh, capital, cabinet level official since Madeleine Albright had visited there in the year 2000. And so they had 
huge expectations about uh, my visit. And they were uh, bitterly, bitterly disappointed when I wasn't there to uh, foster a, or to be the catalyst, the start of a new age, a new era in the relationship between, uh, uh, well, the United States and North Korea and North Korea and South Korea. The, the, they were really bitterly disappointed uh, at, at that, as, uh, as I found out. And uh, they got quite threatening. Um, second day I was there, uh, I was informed by a North Korean functionary that uh, the population of Pyongyang uh, had learned of my presence and uh, they couldn't get, no, could no longer guarantee my safety and security nor that of my uh, very small delegation. So um, that's that's the uh, proposal. I've I've been public about this in the past. I, I've I've written about it. Um, I've had a, I had a debate with uh, Joe Detrani, uh, many of you know, is a good a good great friend and colleague about uh, about this. Uh, uh, we did it in a semi public forum, and uh, I'm sure I didn't persuade anybody, and probably won't won't tonight. But uh, I, I just think. Uh, in the context of uh, perhaps rethinking our approach, because uh, the one we've been been, been pushing has, hasn't hasn't been very successful. So I'll uh, I'll stop there and uh, open it up for uh, uh, questions and, and rebuttals. I'm sure. Thank you, Jim. Uh, before we go any further, uh, let me make a brief comment. ICAS is not an agent of any government or foreign principles. There's no foreign funds involved in ICAS activities. Thank you. Joe, Fosco, go ahead. I'm glad to, I'm glad to know that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe, go ahead. Hi, General. Uh, you do posit a very controversial uh, concept for sure. It seems to me it's slightly incomplete, though. If you're really going to accept North Korea as a nuclear power, You've got to think about South Korea and Japan, our allies, who might also want to be in that category. Yeah, so. that's true. I mean, there's all kinds of downsides to this, and, and that's one of them. Another one, uh, which uh, frankly bothers me, is that this is essentially a reward for bad behavior. That's the way the North Koreans would take it, <laughs> and I, I get that. Uh, but I, in the end, I'm trying to be pragmatic here. Uh, uh, what, what can we do? What can be done to, to better influence or have some hope of influencing North Korean behavior? And the policy we followed doesn't seem to be doing that. So you point out a, a serious concern, um, but I, I hasten to uh, repeat what I said is that de facto, you know, that's the situation. The North Koreans have nuclear weapons. That, that's the perception that, that the region has. That probably has engendered uh, the discussion that particularly went on during uh, the late Prime Minister Abe's time about, uh, you know, pursuing a, a nuclear ca weapons capability in Japan. Um, so it, it would have all kinds of implications that would have to be sorted out, uh, no question about it. And there, there are unquestionably downsides to doing that, just as there are downsides of what we're doing now. But if, if you're going to give up on the denuclearization, what would, how about asking in return that uh, they close the gulags and you make some progress on human rights? There's Absolutely. a demand we can make. Absolutely. Uh, I would think of what, what, what things would we want to extract from them in, in return for acknowledging uh, the uh, that that is exactly the the, the, the thing to do, and I, I don't I haven't thought of everything, but that certainly is one thing is uh, getting them to open up, which they fear, by the way. Um, so, uh, and that's another thing is uh, is promote a change in their uh, human rights uh, approach. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Jasper, go ahead. Yes, thanks a lot, uh, Jim. Um, very interesting comment. I had some other comments I was going to ask you about, but this is too interesting. 
And I'm quite in support of you, really. Um, I've been arguing for years and years not to accept the nuclear side, um, but to sort of table it, uh, sort of put it on the side and talk about other things, especially what I like to talk about is economic reform. You know, I liked uh, Trump's idea very much. I really did like his summits and all that. But I thought that our side, we, you know, we pushed the idea of investment or pouring into North, opening up North Korea. To me, that's the, that scares them, just like you said. They would be afraid of Samsung coming in there. What I've argued for years and years, and even more now, is that what North, what we have to, we need to help them reform their economy, open up their economy internally. They have such huge money problems inside the country. You know, they're using dollars and yuan. It's just crazy, crazy economics inside their country. And um, I've thought for years that at a more technical level, not a senior level, um, I mean, the senior level would help. The, the presidential level, level, I thought, would help. Now, it didn't. But I thought, uh, I still think at a, at a more technical level, uh, American experts going in and talking with North Korea about sim not simple things, complicated, like how do you, how do you manage a, uh, a dollarized economy? Well, we kind of know how to do that. Um, North Koreans have a lot of trouble with that. So I'm thinking there are all kinds of technical level issues that really aim to open them up to get human rights improvements, a lot of good things <laughs> going in North Korea that would basically make their nuclear program prohibitively expensive. I mean, if they, if they paid well, for it, they couldn't afford it. Um, anyway, so I, I appreciate what you're saying here. Well, uh, Bill, I, I, uh, by the way, it's great to see you again. Uh, I agree with you. And the, the, this would have to be premised, though, in order to get to, get to that stage of the dialogue, the North Koreans would have to be persuaded that uh, we meaning principally the United States and the Republic of Korea, are not going to foment a coup. We're not going to invade or do anything like that. And somehow that, I think actually the most persuasive voice for that mm. would come from Seoul rather than Washington. Uh, but I, I think you're exactly right about you know the, the inducements, which I think we need to be a lot more explicit about, I'm not sure when um, President Trump engaged that there was a clear menu of here's what we're going to offer. Oh, there's Joe Detrani. Well, we can Joe, we can have our debate again. Uh, so the the issue is what inducements can we offer, and what would they be comfortable with if they can be assured we're not going to invade them or. Uh, overthrow the family, which is, you know, that's crown I would jewel just for say them. The, I'll just say the other side to that is I, I think that their biggest concern isn't a South Korean fomented revolution, but an internally fomented, well, you know, and that's, that's what they should be very afraid of. And that's what we all should be afraid of, actually. We would like big change in North Korea. But I, it seems to me that a good conversation with them on issues like money, inflation, those kind of issues, that's what causes an internal revolution in North Korea that may happen any day. Well, um, if we can show them how to fix those things that uh, result, the combination of which results in profound hardship for the, Amer for the uh, North Korean people, and that uh, they could, th that would change the perception perhaps of, um, of the family. As, as a more benign uh, uh, one that, that, that genuinely cares about the, uh, uh, the you know, the, the, the economic situation, uh, the, the lives of their people. Uh, and, and, and some technical discussions on how to fix things, well, maybe, that, maybe that's, uh, that's an inducement. Again, I haven't thought all this through, you know, we'd have to get, uh, Real, real live experts, which I don't, I don't purport to be, to think through what, how, how to approach this, what to say, and what would induce the North Koreans to change their behavior. Thank you, Joe Bertrani, Ambassador. Come on. 
Well, look, it's a it's a great honor to see Director Clapper. How are you, Director? <laughs> I'm well, it's Joe. Really, How are you? It's really I, I, I don't know if you heard earlier, I, I talked about our debate about this. Oh, yeah, I did. I heard that. <laughs> okay. No, absolutely. It was a great debate. No, you make some excellent points. I, I particularly like what you said about the intersection. Uh, that can be doable. Madeleine Albright, as you said, in 2000 proposed that. These, these are things that are doable, but it, it gets back to Joe Bosco, Bosco's question, Jim. And I know we talked about this before because South Korea and Japan and maybe even Taiwan and others will say despite the US extended deterrence commitments we need our own nuclear weapons and and you know what really bothers me a lot and if you could address that director clapper is what uh, what North Korea did with Syria and Al Kabar when they provided them and here we were providing them with light water reactors heavy fuel oil and and they, and they were providing Syria with the capability of having their own nuclear weapons facility, if you will, another Jungbyon in, in Al Kabar. It's the proliferation issue, the assurances that the, uh, accepting them as a nuclear weapon state. And you said that they would have to be a responsible stakeholder. Well, and, but how and do we assure, ensure that? I mean, that well, would be. Proliferation is, would be a, a condition, no, no proliferation. Uh, to other countries of, of any nuclear capability or, or expertise or equipment or anything, uh, nuclear material, that would be an, a no-no. And they would have to agree to some mechanism for verifying that. And they may not want to do that. I, I, don't, I don't know. We, we, don't have, we don't have any uh, conditions that we impose right. to, go, to govern the Pakistani nuclear program or right. the Indian right. nuclear program. Right. Uh, so I'll, uh, the likelihood the North Koreans accepting I mean, is, is, is pretty slim. So just go back As to you Joe. And I just, go ahead, Joe. Just to go back to Joe Bosco's question, what about South Korea, Japan, and maybe even Taiwan and others going nuclear? Would that be of concern to you? Well, it would. And uh, this, all, I'm going to relate two potentially unrelated things here with respect to uh, Japan and, and and the region, for that matter, which has depended on us for the nuclear shield for decades, and what this points out uh, to me, what and I I think the the only convincing argument we could make to them not to equip, acquire their own nuclear weapons would be to say we're going to modernize our nuclear capability, and a part of that modernization will be an enhancement of our nuclear shield and that we would recommend you not uh, uh, adopt or acquire your own nuclear weapons. So that is that is a separate issue that there is some controversy uh, attached to because, you know, the, the hallway wisdom, which I'm not sure is accurate, but is uh, Democrats are not for modernizing our nuclear arsenal or not for using nuclear weapons and Republicans are. So that has all kinds of internal domestic uh, political considerations. But if I were king, which I'm not, I would press on with our nuclear modernization. And I think we, we know the outlines of it. Uh, you know, B-21 for the Air Force, uh, new uh, submarines and a commitment to build them uh, for uh, SLBMs. And clearly, a modern and, and most importantly, a modernization of our ground based ICBM force. So, that to me would be what I would the argument I would try to make to the likes of Japan and, uh, and, and the Republic of Korea or Taiwan or others that we will enhance our nuclear shield that has protected you for decades. So, there's no need for you to do that. And if you did that, would actually be more destabilizing. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Dennis Halpin out there? Dennis? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Well, I would just say a, a couple things about this concept. One is using the India and Pakistan model, I would point out once India went nuclear, there was no nothing in this world that was going to restrain Pakistan, its people, and its military from having a nuclear weapon because of the 
historic animosity. And I think it's just totally unrealistic to think people in Japan would accept an American nuclear umbrella if they knew there was a North Korean nuclear bomb. I think Taiwan would be dragged into it. And the other concern I have is you would have six nuclear powers in Northeast Asia if you count Russia. And we're now in an era where Northeast Asia is the center of virulent nationalism like we saw in Europe at the turn of the 20th century. I mean, the Chinese uh, bloggers like the way they went after Nancy Pelosi in her visit, but that's to Taiwan, but that's just only one example. You have virulent nationalism in Russia, as you've seen in Ukraine. In North Korea, you've had it. And you even have elements of that in our allies in both South Korea and Japan. You have very nationalistic feelings. So we presumed at the turn of the 20th century that economics, now trade is centered in Asia, economics was centered in Europe, that economics would maintain the peace. But the arms race and the virulent nationalism in Europe in 1914 created a world war. And I just think if North Korea went nuclear, there's no, you can sweet talk in Tokyo all you want. There's no way the Japanese would ever feel comfortable with depending on the US against a North Korean nuclear capability because of history, nationalism, other issues. Uh, and I think South Korea would feel obligated, and then I think Taiwan would feel obligated. And you'd have this armed nuclear, I just, I don't think we'd get through the next 30 years without a nuclear war. Well, uh, you know, I, I uh, respect your point of view. I uh, w would simply observe that the North Koreans already have the bomb. That's a fact. Uh, in fact, their nuclear capabilities expanded in the face of our denuclearization policy. And I'd also su suggest that the relationship we have with Japan and, and the Republic of Korea is a, a bit different than the relationship we have with Pakistan and India. So anyway. Sick Hacker, go ahead. Sick? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, uh, General, very, uh, very interesting. Uh, but let, let me... Um, just pull on a few strings where uh, you said that what's failed in U.S. policy and will continue to fail is this focus uh, on denuclearization. I, I guess that's, that's not quite uh, the way that I see it. I think maybe what's failed uh, is the focus, the, the single focus on denuclearization. And as you had pointed out, the instructions you got from Obama, that nothing will be done until you denuclearize. So what really happened during Bush administration, during Obama administration, and again, during the Trump administration, is that none of them were really willing to give or, or to do serious negotiations unless North Korea denuclearized first. And, and that's what I consider to be the problem. My own view, you know, in terms of recognizing that North Korea has nuclear weapons, well, as you said, they do, you know, so we do certainly need, need to uh, deliver that and, and recognize that. Uh, but recognizing them, you know, what does that really mean? I mean, recognizing them as a state with nuclear weapon, you know, uh, with new weapons, would that mean they would stop continuing to build up their capabilities to still deter the United States? You know, what if instead uh, on just focusing on denuclearization before a serious negotiation, focusing on the fact that none of those administrations were willing to allow North Korea to have a civilian nuclear program, uh, which also certainly then pushed, the, you know, would have pushed them in, in a different direction. So wouldn't it be possible, you know, that you'd actually get a different result if you could have serious negotiations 
But I would never walk away from the fact that the end game has to be a North Korea without nuclear weapons, but that we have to be serious about negotiating that direction while they have nuclear weapons. So that's that's my comment. Well, I, I agree with that. I think, uh, but I think the process has to start with somehow trying to cap. Uh, that's why I mentioned the uh, arms control regime of some sort to, to cap what they have so that they are they are not required to give up their ticket to survival, which is the way that I think they think about uh, their nuclear uh, capability. You know, one of the disappointments when President Trump met with Kim Jong-un was that here, here, here was a golden opportunity to, act, to ask Kim Jong-un, what would it take? What, what would be the inducements that you would re require? And, you know, and let's be, as Senator Stennis would have said, specific about what it is you'd want to enter into some serious arms control negotiations with so at some point in the future denuclearize i'm not I, I should have made that clear at the outset i, I you know i i think if if we could get new north korea to get rid of its nuclear weapons that would be a great thing but declaring that our policy is denuclearization and we're really not going to do much with you until you you do that is, is a non i think is a non-starter Okay, Oli, Heinonen, go ahead. Oops, oops, I didn't ask. Thank you very much, General. I think this is a good approach, the, this kind of stepwise denuclearization, which starts with the arms contract. And we should not forget that the United States of America has also promised when it signed the NPT at one day to do away with the nuclear weapons. So if uh, North Korea is there, they take the same obligation. And this kind of stepwise approach may be build confidence um, between us and, and then, them. And then I would really love to hear what Mr. Trump talked with North Korea, in particular when they decided to partially eliminate the Puengyuri text test site because this was a kind of sign towards the denuclearization sign not to conduct immediately nuclear test and we probably were not able to seize this opportunity and then a year later we had this problem in Hanoi where they also put something on the table and even when uh, this was rejected by us they still waited more than one year before they really started uh, substantial activities in uh, in Pyongyang. So, what they were waiting? So, I'm sorry. I didn't was there a question there? I didn't, I didn't hear that. So, the last was that when the Singapore summit failed, North Korea waited still more than one year before it started substantial nuclear activities. Uh -oh. So what they were waiting, they were probably waiting something because everything was ready. They were dressed up and ready to go, with the exception of uranium enrichment, which was apparently running all the time. But I mean, plutonium production and no nuclear weapon tests. And there was quite a period also without any major missile tests. <laughs> so they were waiting well, something. That's a good point. I, uh, I don't know. I, I suppose they perhaps were trying to be patient to see if there would be some form of follow-up, uh, which which didn't come from from the United States. So I, uh, it, it's a good point, and I, I like many others, and trying to figure out the North Koreans. I, I I don't know what was going on in their in the minds of their uh, leadership elite about about during that that year. Tong came out there. Tong? Yes, thank you. Thank Go you, ahead. Gino, for doing this for us. We uh, all benefit from your service, your expertise, and your wisdom. And I uh, highly commend that uh, you came up with uh, this idea of a new, taking new approach. It will require a transformation of leadership to begin with, and then also support from all the all the uh, subordinate agencies and people who work for the country. Now, uh, 
couple of questions. Number one, when you visited in Pyongyang at uh, 2010, and after you talked to North Koreans there, have you thought of a kind of ideas that you are expounding upon today? Question number one. Number two, how would you uh, assess the atmosphere or pros and cons amongst the members of the Intel community, uh, which uh, you've been heading for many years and you know all the practical, the players in the international in, in intelligence communities and agencies as well. And also what the Biden, Biden administration would need is some kind of a support from the working level people and their staff and all that, and how you access it, there is any support for this kind of a new idea. Thank you. Well, let me uh, respond to uh, your first question, which I think is an important one. The, my main interlocutor when I was there was one uh, Kim Young Chul, who at the time was head of the the RGB, the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is the North Korean analog to the Soviet Russian GRU. And he touted himself as my uh, opposite number, uh, my uh, counterpart. Uh, Violently anti-American, just uh, exuded hatred for the United States through his pores. I think he'd been assigned by Kim Jong to host me and uh, because he certainly didn't volunteer for it. And we had a very long, the first night I was there, a very long 13 course dinner. And uh, the discussion uh, got very nasty. He was, he was, uh, it, it was not pleasant, I'll put it that way. The only point I was able to make that had some resonance with him and by the way, he later became the uh, letter carrier uh, between uh, Kim Jong Un and, and President Trump. Um, the only point that I seen that seemed to resonate at all with him, where he wasn't didn't have poking my chest with his finger, was when I made reference to the fact that the United States has no permanent enemies. As, you know, witness Germany and Japan. And I cited my own personal experience of uh, Vietnam. I served two tours in Southeast Asia. That was my war. And uh, it was a terrible experience. Uh, The first tour I was there, 65 and 66, I hated it. And it was 43 years before I went back to Vietnam. And I saw how much Vietnam had changed for the better. Uh, The economic success that Vietnam was enjoying, uh, the, uh, the better quality of life of, of, their, of the Vietnamese people. And the fact that we had diplomatic relations with Vietnam, economic relations, intelligence relations even, to some extent. I said, so could it be with the DPRK? Uh, they always use the formal name for them. The, um, and that seemed to take him aback that that you know that there was the possibility. I said, here we are, uh, former enemies, the United States and Vietnam, and now we're we are the relationship has changed profoundly, and uh, that that was the one point seemed to resonate with him. As, uh, you asked me too many other questions, I couldn't remember them all, but the the other one was uh, one of them was you know what what about support or not for a new approach and i suspect there's very little support for it um now within the intelligence community we you know we're supposed to be policy neutral the intelligence community is so the intelligence community would just provide its best judgment its best assessment about the north korean capabilities and what to go with that it's policy maker decision about what to, you know whether to change our policy or, or, or not and I'm sorry if you could repeat the questions I missed. I'm sorry. Oops, I guess we lost them. Uh, well, I oh, guess you. There you are. The question, but my real question was 
I think Biden administration has uh, uh, squandered one year without really accomplishing anything, and there is no way. And even South Korean President Yoon uh, just a couple of weeks ago proposed a bold and broad proposal to denuclearize North Korea. And he didn't ask for denuclearization first, but simply asked for dialogue for the topic of denuclearization. Then he said he would start supporting North Korea, providing economic aid and fundamental uh, infrastructures and what have you and so forth. But North Koreans have clearly and and rejected uh, rejected the proposal. And he, they said they don't even like to talk to him anymore. And there is no way. Yeah. Like you pointed out, they're going to talk, come back to South Koreans. But I think that your idea, suggestion, suggest the idea of a new approach may uh, have some uh, resonance in some segments of the South Korean population, not all of them, but at least about 40 to 50 percent of them, and 50 percent were opposed to, against such a thing under a lot of other reasons and uh, ideological reasons included. But nevertheless, I think uh, uh, Biden administration have three more years and to do anything uh, other than assessment of intelligence communities as you provide, you explain to us, you did provide, but nevertheless, there will be some leadership and there will be some people who got to take, start taking actions. I think this new idea of a new approach is coming from a such a high level as yours. Uh, in terms of authority and experience and wisdom, I think it has a, a big impact on on the prospect of this new idea. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, I, I think you ascribe uh, way too much influence to me, but I, I think I think the Biden administration is, uh, you know, I think their policy is is called strategic patience, which to me is a euphemism for exasperation. And, you know, we have other fish to fry around the world right now, and they just don't have the, you know, the wherewithal or interest in focusing on the Korean Peninsula. Not to say they shouldn't, but uh, I think that's I think that's the case. I think there have been so many efforts made with with uh, to attempt to do something about North Korea under, under the broad policy umbrella of denuclearization. And uh, I think in the minds of many it's uh, it's been it's been a futile exercise thank you don kirk go ahead well thank you uh, a lot of interesting points have been raised uh it seems to me if uh if north korea uh if we recognize north korea as a, as the world's ninth or tenth nuclear power that would give japan a terrific uh opportunity to do away finally with article 9 of its peace constitution and japan uh, is potentially in my view the strongest military power in the region stronger than china and stronger than russia potentially it's all potential so i just think we'd let that genie out of the bottle but the other uh, question is uh, the real question I, I was just making a comment but there, of course you i would love your view the real question is uh, what on earth makes you think that all these economic inducements and all this talking would have the slightest effect after Kim Yo Jong, the younger sister of Kim Jong Un, uh, specifically told South Korea's president to shut up? That was her exact wording in the English language case CNA. Uh, how can we expect uh, this kind of uh, these these lures that, that you're basically talking about resurrecting the? suggestions of uh, Im Young Bak and numerous others. How can you possibly expect that North Korea is going to react positively to any of this? Thank you. I don't know that they will. Uh, uh, even if we came at them with, uh, hey, we want to try a new approach here, OK? Uh, we're we're going to recognize you as a, as, a, as a nuclear player. Now, we have a few conditions we want to attach to that. Um, and we, we would expect some changes in your behavior. And you know it's over to them. If they don't want to do that, okay. But uh, again, it's just a, another effort to sort of break the ice that we're in right now, where we uh, follow this policy. You got to denuclearize before we'll do anything. Uh, it it really has had the opposite effect. 
And actually, I kind of liked your comment about uh, the art. I think it's actually Article 4 in their constitution, whatever article it is, but the one that restricts Japanese from um, offensively rearming, actually, and uh, certainly uh, that, that includes uh, nuclear weapons. And that that could be very interesting if the, if the Japanese were to do that. And I agree with you about their potential uh, power um, in, in relation to, to North Korea, certainly, or, or China even. Uh, so that's an uh, interesting genie out of the bottle, which I think a lot of people would be very wary of. Thank you. Thank David you. Lee, go ahead, please. Hi, yeah. Uh, I just had a question about um, the recently North Korea made a point recognized Russian sovereignty. Of course, there were uh, reports from Russian media potential North Korean uh, in the region. So I was wondering, you know, given that much of the 21st century and discourse has been the, how we might. Uh, Utilize you're that how you're, you're breaking up. I, I could hear about every third word uh, you were saying, so I'm sorry. I, I can't respond unless somebody else could, uh, p you know, paraphrase for me. Uh, how about now? Repeat, David, go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you hear me still? Yes, David? I, okay, okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, given uh, uh, North Korea's um, uh, recognition of Russian sovereignty and the, given their growing relation, how you think that might fundamentally change the, the dynamic of the region and whether or not that might change your um, views on how realistic the possibility of North Korean, you know, your proposal of North Korea, especially given the you know, destabilization of the region. I'm not. I'm not sure. Russia. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm getting the drift here on on the the relationship of North Korea recognizing Russian sovereignty. Russian sovereignty in Ukraine. Oh, oh in Ukraine. Yes, and I'm wondering if that budding relationship might kind of give a. Oh. You know, might. Well, complicate the issue. You know what? What can the Russians really do? uh for the north koreans uh at this point uh, given their other preoccupations so i don't i'm not sure that's i, I don't know I, to me it remains to be seen whether that really means anything i'll put it that way thank you david maxwell go ahead yes thank you uh dr kim and thank you general clapper um <laughs> just to, to your last point uh daily nk reported today that russia is shipping wheat uh, to North Korea in return for its diplomatic support uh, for its efforts in Ukraine. So I just offer that. Um, yeah, well, when did the 100,000 North Korean troops moved go to Ukraine as as they offered? Uh, I'd like to see that operation work too. Yes, I, me too. <laughs> uh, so, sir, I think your your remarks tonight are going to be headline news in Korea tomorrow. Uh, I think the Korean press is going to jump all over these, uh, and I I hope that they grasp the nuances of, of what you're saying. But I. I'm afraid that they're going to say that the former director of national intelligence recommends recognizing North Korea as a nuclear power, and uh, and that could be a headline. So, uh, with that, I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Uh, when we talk about the Vietnam, maybe, maybe ought to get off. <laughs> uh, when we talk about the Vietnam model, I think we should remember uh, that it didn't occur until after the U.S. negotiated withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam, and then North Vietnam was able to. Uh, unify under its control the entire, and I think that that is something that North Korea. That's the model that North Korea would surely love. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good point. That's and so point. we talk about Vietnamese economic development. It's after North Korea uh, dominated the peninsula, or North Vietnam dominated the peninsula. Uh, yeah, David, I would just point out to you though that the North Korean government has made many, many con legal con concessions to the South because of the, the economic powerhouse that the south of Korea still is. Yeah. So, um, and it, you know, it's very capitalist in South Korea, particularly in Ho Chi Minh City. Sure, certainly. Um, and great points. 
but regards North Korea, I think we've got to understand the nature of objectives and strategy. Uh, and I think that uh, um, I fear that this kind of proposal will be assessed by Kim Jong-un as success of his political warfare strategy. I mean, he clearly wants this. He wants to be recognized. He wants to negotiate. Uh, you know, he wants to be treated like the Soviet, former Soviet Union. I think that's that's natural. So we have to be careful that uh, you know this kind of proposal doesn't cause him to double down on his political warfare strategy, his blackmail diplomacy strategy, right. and his development of advanced warfighting capabilities for his strategy to eventually dominate the Korean Peninsula. Uh, well, I think David, I got to jump in here because you're you're exactly right, and I, and I mentioned before that one of the downsides to any of different approach with North Korea is if we, if we change our approach from denuclearization, that will be seen and publicized by the North as essentially reward for bad behavior. And that, so that's clearly, and I, I certainly recognize this, is, is a, a real downside, a real negative to um, you know, changing our approach with, with the North Koreans. Yeah, I think I think we'll all recognize it as reward for bad behavior. I think North Korea will recognize it as success, and and will give them the, yeah, the motivation right. to continue to uh, you know its policies of subversion, uh, coercion, blackmail, diplomacy. Right. Um, and I think we have to be clear that its objectives, as no matter how far fetched they are to us, that they still want to dominate the Korean Peninsula under what I like to call the guerrilla dynasty and gulag state of North Korea. And well, we. Have Keep that in mind as the objective. And that said, you know, it's my belief that there will be no end to the nuclear program or the crimes against humanity being committed until there is unification. And, and what I would like to see, and you're actually proposing, I think, a process to manage the situation, but I would like to see three components to President Yoon's audacious plan and a combined alliance plan that adds in a human rights upfront approach, and you mentioned human rights and the importance, which I commend that, an information strategy, uh, because information is the existential threat to the regime, and then a long-term focus on unification. And unification is going to come in four ways. Peaceful, if they want it. War, the, the, the quickest way. Regime collapse, still dangerous. And then internal change inside North Korea who, with an emerging leader that might seek peaceful unification. We need a plan that will give Kim Jong-un uh, the options, the options to change his behavior, okay, the option for him to be forced to change his behavior by the, the elite and the military, or the option to be changed by the Korean people who no longer tolerate the rule. Um, but my real question to you is, have you given any thought to unification, to a policy of unification? I mean, we've we played lip service with it. Uh, Obama and Iman Bak, Obama and Park, even Trump and Moon talked about peaceful unification. Uh, but have you ever given any thought to unification, how that might come about, and and as a stated policy objective, uh, yeah. you know, could we put that in place? Thank you, sir. I, I have, and I, uh, by the way, I, I very much appreciate and and, re and re resonate with your comments. I, I think you're right on. I think ultimately, the Korean Peninsula will somehow will reunify and then the issue is will it be done by force or some other way and i guess what i'm suggesting here by a change in approach is a way of as a catalyst for starting what would i think be a long-term process to reunify now a complication here that we haven't mentioned much is is china now china views i think my opinion China views uh, North Korea as an imperative, as a strategic buffer. And the last time, you know, the Chinese uh, asserted themselves in relation to Korea was about 1951, when they were concerned that they were going to lose their strategic bear, uh, uh, their strategic buffer in the form of North Korea. So there's a, there'd be a real art form here to promoting moving towards reunification, which I agree needs to be the ultimate thing. The Korean people, North and South, and I saw evidence of this when I was there, there is still tremendous emotional magnetism between the North and the South, even though even though their languages are getting different and all that. So I, 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 just to respect 
the emotional, spiritual aspect here of the Korean people, as a people. So the art form of how do you thread that needle of doing, of moving towards reunification in such a way that the North Koreans don't find threatening and that doesn't jeopardize China's position and having a some kind of strategic buffer for them against us. So I think you've, I think David, you've laid it out extremely well, uh, uh, and I, and I, I, I really resonate with what you said. Thanks, sir. I think Thank you, you. Larry yeah. Nix. <laughs> uh, Director uh, Clapper, uh, Taiwan has been mentioned, but not in the way that uh, it is being discussed uh, at great length right now, and. Uh, I have a question about the uh, Taiwan China situation, which I believe is an infinitely greater danger right now in East Asian security than North Korea is. The Washington Post, and I'm sure you read this, contained recently a very lengthy article detailing how the US intelligence community gained knowledge, advanced knowledge, of Russia's plan to attack Ukraine. And the Biden administration passed this knowledge on to key NATO allies and warned the Ukrainian government about the Russian plan to attack. Given your knowledge of the intelligence community, do you believe that U.S. intelligence agencies have any kind of similar capability to discern in advance a definitive Chinese plan to attack Taiwan that would, would enable us to prepare for our response to that, whatever that response would be, but also to warn Taiwan in advance then that an attack was coming. Do you think well, we have that capability at all with all regard right. to China that according to that Washington Post piece, we definitely had with regard to Russia? Well, I don't have any uh, inside baseball uh, on that any longer. Uh, I'm five years out. And uh, I would just, I would suggest to you though, that if the uh, main, if the Chinese PRC were going to physically invade uh, Taiwan, that is, you know, capture Taiwan territory, that the Chinese would uh, necessarily uh, show off preparation for that as much as they might try to hide it now whether they would get uh whether we would get some you know a an order passed down the command chain or something intercept a a, a message that or messages or the message traffic that would indicate i don't know but i think uh from inferentially there would be a lot of indicators that the uh, Chinese were uh, about to invade. I think the Chinese are on their own timetable. Um, I think, um, I don't think an invasion is imminent. I could be wrong about this. I think there's several reasons why the, the Chinese don't want to do that, particularly right now, particularly before the uh, this party Congress this fall when Xi will be anointed probably for the president for life. And I, I don't think he wants a, the uh, all the upheaval that invasion would would do to perhaps jeopardize that china has some profound internal issues um demographics not the least of which challenges with covid a drought right now their economy is not in the best shape so there's a lot of reasons why right now they you know they're not i don't think they're gonna that an invasion of taiwan is imminent i also think the performance of the Russians, military performance, is going to give the Chinese pause. And one of the things that everyone underestimated is, of course, the uh, 
Ukrainians' a bit, uh, will, will to fight, and we profoundly overestimated, even with our warning, we profoundly overestimated the will to fight of the Russians. Well, the Chinese got to think about that. What is the will to fight of their own troops who haven't fought in, co in combat since 1979? Uh, so I think that, you know, and how much resistance would the Taiwanese citizens provide or give to the uh, a Chinese invasion? So I think all those factors, uh, I think right now, at least to me, mean that um, the invasion is not, not imminent. And I don't think we're in a, in a quite as serious a crisis mode. So, but I, in the future, uh, you know, who, know, who knows what the Chinese will, will do, if, but I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's imminent right now. Thank you. Richard White. Richard. Richard, are you there? Well, oh, just one more point on Larry's question before I shut up on that one. Go ahead, Richard. Yes, certainly we, if we did have indications and warning of uh, an invasion by the, the uh, PRC, we'd, we'd certainly share that with the, uh, uh, with the Taiwanese. I think for for that purpose, we'd be better served to assume it. And uh, the Taiwanese, and I noted that they intend to spend a lot more on defense, which is appropriate. And perhaps some of the weaponry that we provided, we provide to the uh, Taiwanese uh, might be better, uh, where we profit from uh, the, our experience with the Ukrainians. And some better kinds of weaponry, uh, or more, they're better suited to repel an invasion, would be in order. John Baugh? Yes, thank you, Dr. Go Kim. Ahead. General Clapper, hi. I, I might suggest if you go back to Pyongyang that you bring a um, a signed basketball with you, like uh, Secretary Albright did. That I should have, I should have taken Dennis Rodman with me. Yeah, that's. Well, I, I think they prefer Michael Jordan's signature on the ball, but uh, I, I do have a, a question for you. Um, what about a non-aggression uh, pact between the U.S., the North Koreans? That would show that we have no intent of, of attacking them. And then later on, perhaps, could, because they're not going to denuclearize. That, that's, well, just, that's not in their DNA right now. Well, yeah, that's right. Well, one thing, I mean, there's been discussions about, you know, right now it's still it's still an armistice. You know, they agreed to stop shooting on the 27th, 27th of July, 1953. Right. But we don't have a peace treaty or a peace agreement. We actually, the United Nations, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, uh, U.S. rock with the, the, the North. So I would assume that if a peace treaty, which has been discussed, were affected, that that would at least implicitly uh, be a non-aggression pact. Yeah, but with the peace treaty, you're going to have to have China on board because South Korea wasn't a signatory yeah, to the that, original anyway. Yeah, that would be good if, if the, Ch the Chinese would uh, enter into an, uh, an agreement. And you're right; they'd have to. They obviously would have to play. I think practically. Uh, that would, and if the Chinese could be, be drawn into that, I, that could be managed appropriately. Could could be a good thing. Hi, this is Richard White. Can you hear me now? I can. Yeah. Go, Sorry, go, the, go, the question go, I had is: ahead, How do you think? Oh, how do you think the yeah, Richard, Chinese and the Russians would view your proposal? Well, I, I mean the uh, non-aggression pact. Is that what no, no, your original proposal about allowing them to keep nuclear weapons under certain. Well, I'd probably, I'd, I think they'd probably be fine with the Russians. I, they'd be okay with it. Okay, Richard. Okay, Dorothy Hong, go ahead. Dorothy, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, to me, stepping into the shoes of North Koreans. Uh, this is really uh, creation and destruction dynamics, uh, meaning uh, according proper parties, their unique thoughts, actions, and labors. Uh, I mean, there have been handful, 
I'm going into like three digits now, talking about bread basket on the table, monkey business. Uh, we're not just talking about labor issues. We're talking about IP rights and IT issues. Um, it's really long overdue. Uh, North Korean refugees who came to this country have been disproportionately victimized uh, in their livelihood in their social life and in uh and then i firsthand uh eyewitness to uh victimization in higher education in schools uh and i think that they're having become victims uh for their lawful integration activities uh can trigger and just snowball down into North Korea territory and giving them legitimization to use nuclear weapon. So the best way is to recognize, 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 accord the proper parties, their thoughts, actions, and labors. Well, thank you for that. There are, I think, a comment I would make that, uh, you know, uh, a discussion like this, there are just all kinds of implications um, to a change in, in uh, policy that I, I certainly haven't thought about uh, that that uh, we, we would have to contend with. Uh, there's no question about that. Thank you, David Shakir. Shakir James, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, General. Thank you for speaking with us. <clears throat> for what it's worth, I want to say that I um, agreed with you, uh, your opinion that we should definitely rethink our North Korea policy. Um, I think that a lot of folks here would also agree with that. We might disagree greatly on what the next step or what our new policy should look like, but I think we all agree um, that something uh, needs to be changed. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask you this question. Uh, now, take this with a grain of salt. I only ever saw this reported in the Korean press, so it might not be so accurate, but uh, according to what I read, uh, General Brooks, former USFK commander, once said that we should take North Korea and eventually work to make North Korea an ally. Uh, never mind denuclearization, never mind uh, peace treaty, never mind you know um, integration or anything like that, make them an ally. And um, obviously a lot of folks have their own opinion about that, but I think that General Brooks is kind of hitting on something. One of the, con one of the um, uh, criticisms I tend to have on North Korea policy is that it tends to lack vision. And in this situation, when we talk about North Korea's denuclearization, I think where a lot of us are kind of missing something, which is that the reason why North Korea has nuclear weapons is because it's a security guarantee. In a world in, a world in which North Korea doesn't have nuclear weapons, we have to think about what replaces that security guarantee. That need for a security guarantee doesn't go away. So what replaces it? In General Brooks's example, we have this weird situation where that security guarantee, in theory, is replaced by us, essentially, the, the, the U.S.-aligned system, and by extension, particularly in the nuclear aspect, um, by our nuclear weapons, essentially, if we were to bring North Korea into the nuclear umbrella, which, as an ICBM guy by trade, if you notice see the, the models around me, that, that really raises my eyebrow a lot. And so I was just wondering... On that aspect, on, well, on the first aspect, the idea of making North Korea into an ally, what do you think about that? And then if not, if if, an, if we make them an ally or if we don't make them an ally, what does the security situation in Northeast Asia look like if North Korea no longer has nuclear weapons? Thank you. Thank you, well, um, Yeah, thanks. Um, would making them uh, an ally uh, precede or come after uh, reunification. Uh, in other words, uh, I'm not quite sure how we get to making North Korea as as a DPRK an ally. I think it, actually, I think it's a great idea. You know, uh, I have a lot of respect for Vince Brooks. He's a really smart guy, and uh, he's thought about these things. So I think. Uh, that's an idea worth considering. I think the what we'd have to think through, and I, I don't off the top of my head, I'm not smart enough to figure that out tonight, but what would the relationship be with, with that, having North Korea as an ally in some form, 
and reunification uh, to David Maxwell's point, and I think ultimately that that has to happen, uh, a reunific reunification. So under that scenario, well, the whole country would be an ally, I would hope. Nobu Tanaka out there? Nobu? If not, David Maxwell, do you have follow-up question? Uh, no, no, I don't. I'm good. Okay. Thanks. I appreciate uh, the general's comments. Okay. Don Kirk. It's a bonus. Uh, yeah. I, so, so Go many ahead, points, Don. Yeah. So many interesting points have been raised. But, uh, you know, I uh, just wanted to pursue the question of what kind of inducements we could give to get back into talks uh, since everything else has failed four party talks six party talks uh, and and kim uh kim jong un is not responding either to south korea or to the us so what's the next step uh to, well, to inducement you know I, I don't know how to bring this off but i mentioned earlier that um i thought uh president trump missed a golden opportunity to ask Kim Jong Un and get and get a, a what it what it what what would it take what would be your inducement over the long haul to change your behavior and you know then I don't know how he'd respond but at least there'd be, it'd be the opportunity to get it from the horse's mouth uh, what is it you'd want I'm not sure we understand what would induce the North Koreans to change their behavior certainly some form of security. That's that's what motivates them now to um, have nuclear weapons and expand their their capability. Is it for them? It's it's about, all about survival, and they understand that nobody'd pay any attention to them if it weren't for their nuclear weapons or the or the perception that they have weapons that work, and that's all they have to that's all they have to create is the perception for for the sake of deterrence. So I think it's a, it's a great question. We can speculate, but to me, the best thing to do would be to ask them. Um, you know, maybe there would be, so, should be some form of communication between President Biden and Kim Jong Un. Doesn't have to do it in person. You know, have have an envoy uh, bring him a letter. Uh, uh, you know, another love letter, I guess. I don't know. Um, I, I think the point, the question you raise is an excellent one, and I'm not sure that we really know. Thank you. Sungjae Park out there? Sungjae? Sungjae Park? Ambassador Detrani out there? Yeah, yeah, final point. Uh, uh, hello? Yeah, yeah, this is go just... Ahead. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. So, go ahead. Uh, Sungjae, well, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of questions. First question is, if U.S. recognize North Korea as a nuclear weapon country, then after that, North Korea can sell the nuclear weapon to other country because of guarantee by U.S.? That's the first question. And second question is, according to North Korea, propaganda said, you know, they join with the IAEA and then steal the technology from the IAEA and the NPT, and then they just uh, get out from the NTP. So now they have a nuclear weapon. Is that means other country can follow the North Korea model so they can have a nuclear test then US going to recognize them as a nuclear weapon country? That's the two questions. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure we don't uh, attach a, a, a too much importance to um, the fact that the North Koreans already have nuclear weapons. And so um, I'm not convinced either just how much that would change anybody's behavior and other nations' behavior just, just because we say, okay, we now recognize the fact that the, what we've known for years, de facto, that the North Koreans have nuclear weapons. And so Okay, we're facing up to that fact, rather than uh, not a failure to recognize the, the what what is really exists. So I, I I'm not sure uh, all these kind of implications would happen or not. 
if we simply approach North Korea differently by recognizing what they have and trying to deal with it. Uh, and I would vote for some form of an arms control regime. And if they don't want to enter into that and in and, and return for some inducements, and we'd have to find out what those what would appeal most to the North Koreans, because I'm not sure we know. So, I, I, again, this is a tough problem. Um, we've been doing business uh, one way for a long time, and, and it, it, uh, we, we haven't achieved our objective <laughs> of denuclearizing. In fact, just the opposite. Ambassador just, Tirani, go ahead, yeah, Joe. Yeah. Director Clapper, you've been very generous with your time and, and your comments are really insightful. And I'm not just saying that either. And you're absolutely right. There has to be a different paradigm here. Because if we, we keep doing the same thing, and certainly strategic patience isn't moving us anywhere. They're getting more nuclear weapons and missile delivery systems. It's, it's so obvious. Uh, but, you know, we do know what they want. We do know they want security assurances. We do know that they want the, the sanctions lifted because they're really biting. And we also know that they do want a normal relationship with the United States. And in many ways, as we've said to them many times, certainly in the six party talks, the best security assurances you can get is normalization of relations with the United States, with embassies in Washington, we have embassies in Pyongyang. And your point, Director Clapper, is right on. You talked about an interest section. And you mentioned Madeleine Albright in 2000. She talked about an interest section. That could be a process, and it's actions for action. So it may be a question of terminology, what we're talking about here, arms control or what have you. But if we're talking about actions for actions, we're not saying a Libya model where you denuclearize first before you get any deliverables. We're talking about as you move towards disabling, dismantling your nuclear weapons infrastructure, you will get the benefits. And ultimately, with complete verifiable denuclearization, there will be normalization of relations, obviously security assurances, et cetera, and the lifting of sanctions. So in some ways, I think we're talking about the same thing, but it's also a question of perception. And, and, and that's why the North Koreans need to come back to the talks, I think. What the, what the UN administration, UN Yo's administration put on the table is a good opening volley for them to come back. And, you know, hopefully the Biden administration and, and, and the US side and others would really endorse it in a significant way to get North Korea to realize being tethered to China and to Russia, is that their best future? What do you say about that, General Clapper? Do you think that's where they would like to be in the long term, tethered to an ally with Russia and China rather than the United States and the ROK? Well, I, I, I think no. I think uh, I think their preference would be not to be tethered uh, to China, and I and I think the history has been that the Russians have actually been pretty duplicitous with uh, with North Korea over over the years. So I, I think they, they would they'd like a they'd like a better life, uh, both with for their people and and a better life in terms of uh, recognition internationally. Um, and and this is what we have to figure out, Joe. Is uh, what 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 are inducements can we offer, and importantly, the sequencing of those inducements. And for some period of time. I believe in order to get the North Koreans into this at all, you're going to have to recognize them as a nuclear power with, with a view towards it in the future. And this, this isn't going to happen by close of business Friday, is moving towards uh, a, a, a less threatening posture, I'll put it that way. But for some period of time, they're going to have to have some kind of nuclear capability just for their own, their own security. <laughs> And their and their own their, their feeling of of survival, and uh, I'm not sure we appreciate that uh, sufficiently. Thank you, General. Okay, Dennis Alpin, this is last question. Go ahead, Dennis. Oh well, I was just going to more make a comment uh, to General Clapper and to Ambassador Detrani. Ambassador Detrani, 
you might remember talking about the liaison office in 1996 in Beijing at the embassy when you and I were there. Chuck Cartman, remember him from long ago? Came out to Beijing and there was the meeting. I was there. I don't know if you were there with the Swedish embassy. And we asked them to open and in, uh, to look after American interests in Pyongyang because we had had some young people like Mr. Hunziker, young people or people being retained by the North Koreans. And the Swedish embassy said at the meeting, well, we cover Pyongyang out of Beijing. We don't really have a budget for that. And we said, oh, don't worry. It'll only be two or three years. And that was 26 years ago. So that's my comma. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Some Dennis. things don't change. <laughs> Well, I, I need yeah. to go because I've got a, I got a right. commit, uh, commitment here, but just let me... Uh, this was great evening, and we'll get back to you. Let's well, give and, uh, General a big round of applause. Well, you've been, very, you. you've been very gracious about the beating you've, you've given me, uh, the flogging. So so uh, thanks for listening, and it's, uh, the, uh, I think it's been a great discussion. Thanks Thank for you, having Joe. Me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank we you. love your golden retriever. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, she, she wants a little attention, I think. A little attention, right. Okay. All, All right. right. Bye-bye. Thank you Thank very you much, ladies and gentlemen. Meeting is adjourned. Right. Thank Take you. Take care now. Bye. Bye.